how rising groundwater caused by climate change could devastate coastal communities. So I found this article really interesting. So higher sea levels will push the water table up with them, causing flooding, contamination, and all the manner of unseen chaos. This is by Kendra Pierre Lewis. This was released December 13, 2021. So Faye Salinas does not want your sympathy. Salinas, along with her 46-year-old daughter, Lauren, spent last winter, their COVID winter, in Saugus, Massachusetts, in a house without a working furnace. Salinas is in her 70s. Lauren, because of the brain injury she experienced in the womb, is a quadriplegic, blind, and affected by a seizure disorder, among other disabilities. So in winter, it's not unusual for overnight temperatures in Salvas to dip into the tens. So the two could not long survive without heat. So absent a furnace, they relied on a space heater with the cost of electricity to power it was $750 in winter alone, and it warmed only one single bedroom. Salinas doesn't tell this story to engender sympathy, but rather as a warning. The water table, she says, is rising, seeping into gas lines, corroding furnaces, from the inside out. That's what happened to hers. And she wants you to know that if you live anywhere near the coast, even one, two, three miles away, the water might be coming for you too. For something you've probably never heard about, rising groundwater presents a real and potentially catastrophic threat to our infrastructure. Roadways will be eroded from below Septic systems won't drain. Sea walls will keep the ocean out, but trap the water seeping up, leading to more flooding. Home foundations will crack, sewers will black backflow, and potentially leak toxic gases into people's homes. So Saugus is a small town roughly 10 miles northeast of Boston, On maps, water is one of its defining features with the Saugus River and its tributaries meandering through the town and heading through marshland to the Atlantic Ocean. Among those salt marshes blocked from the Atlantic by the peninsula of Revere Beach is where Salinas bought her house in 1975. Given the proximity of the ocean, the source of her recent woes would seem obvious, sea level rise. Since 1950, sea level in the region has risen by eight inches and the change has not been linear. The sea is rising faster now than it did a generation ago, about an inch every eight years. But the water that left Salinas out in the cold did not come from the sea, at least not directly. Her problem began in 2018 when she lost gas and thus heat because of water entering an underground main. It was a problem that would persist intermittently for several years. Water would enter the gas main and enter and then her utility national grid would be forced to shut off the gas. National grid would then try to find where the water was coming from, patch the leak and pump the water out. Officially, national grid has not named the source of the problem, but Salinas thinks the culprit is groundwater. Even under normal circumstance, the cast iron pipes that make up roughly a third of National Grid's infrastructure in Massachusetts are prone to rust and corrosion. She thinks that these pipes, which once sat comfortably above the water table, 
are finding themselves intermittently swamped during seasonal high tides and essentially pushed up the groundwater. It pushes up the groundwater, so, and it's that elevated groundwater that she thinks seeped into the gas main, flooded out her gas meter, and eventually corroded the furnace. So if you see some of the photos here, it shows basically the water table that is rising and communities and houses going right under, under it. The problem is huge. We've way underestimated the flooding problem. Christina Hill, an associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, whom Salinas reached out to in pursuit of answers, agrees. She was asking me, is this something that comes from the sea level rise? And obviously the, the answer was yes, says Hill. Hill is one of a number of researchers trying to get the public and policymakers to take the risk of rising groundwater seriously. Unlike rising seas, where the dangers are obvious, groundwater rise has remained under the radar. Hydrologists are aware of the problem, and it's all over the scholarly research, but it has yet to surface in a significant way outside of those bubbles. So groundwater rise is only briefly mentioned in most recent editions of National Climate Assessment, released in 2018. So it's absent from many state and regional climate adaptations plans and even from the flood maps. And so 2021, a study in a journal Cities found that when the coastal cities conduct a climate vulnerability assessment, they rarely factor in the groundwater rising. They talk mostly about sea level rise, storm surges. Mm -hmm. So this is said by a Daniel Razo, an engineer and scientist affiliated with Stony Brook University who wrote a 2021 paper. But there haven't been a lot of questions about what's going to happen to the groundwater because nobody's scared of groundwater thinking about it you know they're thinking oh it's just groundwater it's not gonna really do anything they're worried about sea level rise and ocean coming in and just taking over but what happens is which sounds more what is happening now impacts on going back to the article the existing infrastructure Planned climate adaptations could be catastrophic. Remediation efforts that haven't planned for groundwater rise will be rendered useless. Billions of dollars in infrastructure will be needed or need to be upgraded. And it will likely affect an area much larger than what's captured on most of those flood maps that we're seeing. You see a lot of flood maps or models, but this is also the main thing here. And so a 2012 study by researchers at the University of Hawaii that factored groundwater into flood risk found the nationwide the area threatened that was more than twice the area at risk from sea level rise alone. So any coastal area where the land is really flat and the geology is the kind of loose material that water moves through really easily says Hill, is where it is really going to be a problem. So this includes places like Miami, Oakland, California, Brooklyn, New York, Silicon Valley communities, the Mountain View, susceptible to groundwater rise, as is in Washington, D.C., worldwide. The area at risk includes portions of the northwestern Europe, coastal areas like the United Kingdom, Africa, South America, East, uh, Southeast Asia. The problem is huge, says Hill. We way underestimated the flooding problem. And because of how groundwater moves, people who are at risk may not know it until it's too late. So one of the most important things about the groundwater is that the rising groundwater level precedes any inundation of the surface. This is said by Arazo. Put another way, we will experience groundwater flooding long before the ocean comes lapping at our front door.
depths of the water beneath our feet. It might seem puzzling and rising seas could cause groundwater to rise, but at the first blush, and two seem unrelated. Um, but the connection is actually simple. It is and has long been ignored reflects our bias towards addressing problems that we can easily see. And so to understand the link, it first helps to understand a bit about groundwater. So the water nestled in sediments underground started as surface water, like rain or snow eventually seeped down. The layers of saturated soil rest below the layer of unsaturated soil. And so the boundary between the two is what's known as the water table. And it is in many coastal areas, this layer of saturated soil, which can be meters thick, rests atop salt water from the ocean. So as the sea levels rise, the groundwater gets pushed up because the salt water is denser than the fresh water. And this isn't the only way that the ocean and groundwater are connected. So the groundwater normally flows out to the sea. This is said by Rosal and all along the coast. So there's what is called the submarine groundwater discharge. You might even notice it if you go to the beach at a low tide. So if you stand in the water, you might feel really cold water right at the edge in the sand. And it's groundwater just running out continuously into the ocean. So thus any protection designed to keep rising seas from encroaching onto the land must also factor in how to let groundwater out. So these pictures don't look very good, do they? Arguably, it says it has a capacity to affect millions and nobody's paying attention. So the first big study in a prominent scientific journal that looked at what sea level rise might mean to groundwater levels was published in 2012. So in a journal Nature by researchers Kolja Rotzo and Chip Fletcher, of the University of Hawaii. So the study came on the heels of a report by the United States Geological Survey, the Yale University researchers who looked at what would happen to groundwater in coastal New Haven, Connecticut, as the sea level rose. So in both cases, researchers found that the two would rise in concert. So we looked at well records that found that the water table in the coastal zones goes up and down with the tides. So this was said by Fletcher. And so we realized that there's a direct connection between the ocean and the water table as well. So, and as the ocean rises due to the climate change, the water table is going to rise with it, eventually flood the land. So we're gonna have all the wetlands in the urbanized areas around roads and what we don't really want them, where we don't really want them, that's where we're gonna see it. And it turns out that this is a form of a sea level rise that in many areas is more damaging than what people classically think of as the ocean flowing over the shoreline and flooding. And we are, we're already seeing these effects happen now. So danger to human health is with all of this going on and talking with experts, the groundwater rise, what often comes up is what is more complicated and harder to adapt to than sea level rise. Any solution to one aspect of the problem can create a cascade of others. So take, for example, something like straightforward as sanitation. Ordinarily, in the most parts of the U.S., when you flush the toilet, one or three things happen depending on where you live. It goes out to the cesspool, a septic system, a sewer line. The groundwater rise presents increasing challenges for the, all three. Cesspools are essentially concrete cylinders with an open bottom and perforated sides, especially in the coastal areas. And the cesspools, which should be dry, instead find themselves constantly inundated says Joseph Sambro, a senior policy director of Honolulu's city council, who until last January was the city's chief resilience officer. 
So there now is a sort of always wet. They are always wet, he says. So microbes stay alive because they are wet, because there's so much more water around it, and they can leach out. And so Honolulu's uh, is not the only city with this issue. So Miami-Dade County is facing similar problems with septic tanks, which in theory provide a layer of filtration and cesspools do not. And but to do the filtration, the system requires a layer of soil two feet deep and the layer shrinks as the water table rises. Already 50% of the country's systems are periodically compromised during storms. So 2040, by that time, estimates suggest that the number will rise to 64%. So failed septic systems can contaminate local aquifers and that a community depends on for drinking. So that's really serious because you can't live without having clean, fresh drinking water. And so one workaround is to switch those households and businesses currently on septic or cesspool systems over the sewer lines, over to the sewer lines. So the Miami-Dade County estimated the cost as a shift of $2.3 billion. Nor the sewer systems and uh, Panacea cautions Berkeley Christina Hill. Most American sewer pipes, both sanitary and storm sewer pipes, are typically cracked because we do such a bad maintenance. So we're like an international joke, she says. People start conferences in civil engineering in Europe with slides of how bad American systems are to loosen up their audience. And those cracked sewer pipes let groundwater in. And in places like New York City, Boston, which are what is known as combined sewer systems, water from rain and water from the raw sewage mingle. So there's less space in the pipes. So this is why the groundwater rises. Places like New York City's Jamaica Bay community end up with liquid bubbling up from storm drains during the high tide. So more cities tend to have systems where rainwater goes into the one pipe and sewage into another. But the pipes are full of groundwater when it rains and there's still nowhere in the rainwater for it to go. So in the both cases, according to the hill, you'll get more flooding. So there's another way too. So in the rising groundwater, it can turn our sanitation systems into killers. So in the Bay Area, there's so much legacy contamination under the ground from military use, Silicon Valley tech blooms. It left a lot of nasty stuff. So this is uh, said by a Chris May, a coastal engineer, climate scientist who founded Pathway Client Climate Institute. And what often happens is we put low income housing in those areas after they're remediated, but they still leave a certain amount of contamination in the ground. And those regulations were based on no rising groundwater table. Now the groundwater table is rising. So as it does, it saturates the soil, unlocking contaminants such as benzene. These chemicals are highly volatile and they have gases that they can easily find their ways into the sewer lines and into people's houses. And so this is the impact of groundwater rise on just one system sewage. And But it could affect many more. So buried electrical lines aren't properly sealed will short out. Foundations will start to heave from the pressure. Some fear that there's a seismic fault that could even be put under pressure. So how water finds a way, how to protect themselves against rising seas, cities are turning to the same tools that they have used centuries, levees, seawalls. Boston has proposed a 175-mile seawall called the Sea Gates Project. Miami has a proposal for a $6 billion, 20-foot high seawall. New York has proposed its $119 billion, six-mile long project called the New York Harbor Storm Surge Barrier. Homeowners in Florida and California are erecting barriers to keep the ocean water out. But the fundamental problem, 
with all these inventions is the same. The sea wall holds back the sea, not the groundwater. So in some areas in the underlying ground is relatively impermeable. It is possible to build a sea wall or levee that slows groundwater rise, but then you're left with other problems. So we call the water moves towards the ocean, a barrier that stops groundwater from rising with sea level will also keep storm water from say recent rainfall from flowing into the sea. So if you don't let the water run out into the ocean, then you have to basically pump it over the wall. And that's essentially what the Netherlands has been doing for several centuries, says Stony Brook Razo. But this too can create problems because so many of the places that the sea walls are working so hard to save, much of the lower Manhattan, large parts of San Francisco and Boston were built on the wetlands, landfill or both. So if they pump the land, is going, it is going to sink. So this is what Hill is saying, so that's not good. And even in the cities where willing to pursue such a path, not every place can. There are lots of conditions where you can pump all day long and the water table won't go down. So this, the University of Hawaii, Fletcher is saying this. So we call the groundwater is water that makes its way into the spaces or pores in the sediment. In some places like Miami, the pores are so large that you're just pulling in water from an estuary from the ocean, says Fletcher. So you can pump as hard as you want, and it just keeps coming in from an endless body of water, the sea. Planners are often oblivious to the problem. In 2009, Maldives, a low-lying island nation held the world's first underwater cabinet meeting to draw attention to the harm of the big climate polluters like the U.S. were perpetuating through the climate in inaction. These messages were clear. You're drowning us these days already dealing with the court consequences of rising seas and the country is consolidating its outer island communities onto a new island called Hull Humale. I don't know if I said that correctly, but that Hull Humale, it's designed to withstand sea level rise, but the pr project did not factor in the rising water table. So they did not understand that the water table will rise with the sea level as well. So this is said by a Fletcher. And so if the seas rise, rises only two more feet, which some estimates say will it will happen in 2040, as soon as that most of the brand new island will be uninhabitable wetland. So when he explained this to the project lead designer, he just st stared at me and he was speechless. It's like he couldn't com comprehend what I was saying, Fletcher says. All the billions of dollars that they spent on this thing and they didn't build it high enough, eroding away history. There is at least one place where you can see people reckoning with rising groundwater in close to real time. Strawberry Banke Museum is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, near the banks of the Piscontaque or uh, Piscontaque River. So just a few miles from the Atlantic Ocean, the buildings were preserved to let us uh, see three centuries into the past, but they were also giving us a glimpse into the future as well. So some of the structures, including the city's second oldest house, are flooding from below. So we're getting these super tides, king tides, and the elevate that elevate the water over two feet higher than typical. So we're also starting to see this water get into our basements. So this is by a Rodney D. Rowland. 
Strawberry Bank Director of Facilities Environmental Stability or Sustainability on a tour to the museum or of the museum in late September. So when you uh, crouch down in the basement with the ceilings too low for most adults to stand, it's easy to see the water marks from the past groundwater incursions. Okay, so the museum has taken a two-prong approach. So the first element is educating the public. And one of the exciting things is that we're going to add a kiosk that is attached to the sensors that were placed in the ground around the museum, said Roland. And they will track the movement of the groundwater plus salinity, temperature, water height, and the visitors will see that there's water under their feet. But the museum also needs to be preserved the buildings to preserve the buildings and the goal must now be balanced with the fight against the rising water. So in one of the houses, we made the decision to take out what was called like the summer kitchen, said Roland. So there has uh, was a, a hearth down there where they cooked in the summertime. We took it out and we put in granite block. So they had to do that because the old hearth was acting like a candle wick drawing water from the basement into the rest of the structure. So now the rest of the chimneys are preserved and that he's added that. So water can't get through that, but we lost that piece of history. And so this is going to be a constant battle with how much we are going to lose and to save and what we can't. So this is like a, like a picture of what could happen where you know, you're trying to save things that seem like they are memorabilia, but things are not going to be savable because you have this groundwater rising and all these things that are changing society as you know it. And so in some ways, Roland is lucky. So his state, New Hampshire, and in at least aware of the risk of groundwater rise and is factoring into it plans that I have not heard anyone else in other cities talking about groundwater. It's mainly, it's like a big umbrella term of sea level rise, and they don't really mention all of the other um, dynamics in that, which is this groundwater and the, uh, the table uh, rising. But the new New Hampshire is an exception, but many other states with more extensive coastal lines are going to have to face the issue in the coming years as not only buildings, but lives that are threatened by this unseen risk. So less than 50 miles down the coast of Saugus, Bay Salinas plans on leaving for higher ground. And so this is where I said that I've seen this. I hate to say this. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I saw this in a dream that the water just started rising and over the years it got more and more and more to where people started to migrate to higher ground. So this is sort of like a picture of what I saw. So less than 50 miles down the coast, Saugus, Faye Salinas plans leaving to a higher ground, but not without making some noise. So she written to legislators, National Grid, and then the press to try to draw attention to the issue of the groundwater that is really important to me, she says. And it's important to me and not only to me, but it has affected my life profoundly. But because I think it has the capacity to affect millions of people, she says, and nobody's prepared and nobody has been paying attention. And so that's pretty much the article. I know it was long, but I thought I found it interesting because it was a piece of what could happen. If you look at the stop sign and you see how the water is rising over it. And if you look at some of the other pictures. And if you look, if you really pay attention and look at some of the graphs that they're showing, there's a house that's underneath and the groundwater that is rising uh, underneath and coming up. And so a lot of people, you know, if you are one of these kind of sci-fi geeks and you look at some of those um, movies where they show these crazy, you know, weather patterns and everything, 
some of that isn't that far out of reality. And so if you look at this picture, take a good look at this picture. Look at how people are on the top of their roofs. And that is what you don't want to happen. But that is what slowly begins to happen when people are left without any other explanation as to what's going on. And you think that these walls and look what happened with the Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina and the levees broke. And for years, they said they were going to fix those levees. And people look just like what you see here. They were on top of their roofs. This is sort of like a little bit slower, but it's not that slow. Because it could happen. And this is bigger. It's a lot bigger. It could happen around the globe where it affects a lot of families, a lot of people. And usually the first people that get affected are people that are in the, the lower end of area, the coastal areas, um, people that are in low income housing. And they're in areas that are more susceptible. Like, you know, what I was told, there are some parts like the Louisiana area where they had the Hurricane Katrina that it, the way it was, it was built like a punch bowl. And that's deep. It was below sea level. So when the levees broke, the water just is just rushing in there and it's just everything is going up, up, up and everybody's on top of their roof. And so that's why you've seen, if you look at those pictures of people waving flags, trying to get help, and then the sewage, you see the animals coming in and then, you know, people that died and then whatever toxic um, gases and things that are dangerous, broken power lines. I know that seems crazy, but not really. And so when are people going to take any of this serious? That's the question.